Well, for those of you who uh, haven't been with us, we've been walking through a sermon series entitled Home Improvement. And and, uh, uh, as we're walking through God's Word, seeing His truths, His truth speaks to every area of our lives, and especially in our personal lives. And we're going, we're going to be all over the place just in terms of looking at finances, looking at relationships, how do we navigate conflict, uh, uh, romance, dating, sex, marriage, hospital, all over the place here. Just God speaks to everything. And we're going to be walking through over these uh, next months through these things. And we're starting here, we've been in parenting looking at God's wisdom and his truth as it speaks to us in our homes and and raising our kiddos. Our passage for today is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, if you want to turn there in your Bible or Bible app, where you can follow along. That's going to be our main passage, but we're also going to be uh, uh, following God's word in the the book of Proverbs as well. Just a quick reminder of where we've been. You can go back a slide there where we've been here, looking at parenting, remembering that uh, our parents, that God has designed for us to influence our children through structure and relationships. Our role isn't to control, our responsibility isn't to control our kids, but to be under control of the Holy Spirit. These are critical truths that we, that we need to understand in terms of appropriately being able to experience God's blessing in parenting. We talked about how rules and relationship, rules without relationship lead to rebellion, but relationship without rules will lead to disrespect and reckless kinds of behavior. We're focusing to, in, in, in today is part two of looking at God's design for structure in the home, for discipline and the goodness of that. The, the, this image here of a butterfly emerging from a cocoon, I, I referred to this last week, the, where the process of a butterfly coming out of the cocoon requires that butterfly to, to beat itself against the walls of the cocoon in order to, for that cocoon to open up. And it's this process, this laborious process, the butterfly beating its wings against the, the walls of the cocoon in order for it to get the strength it needs that when it comes out of the cocoon, it can fly. You see, if the, if the caterpillar, if the, if the butterfly uh, d- just came right out of the cocoon, it'd fall right to the ground, and it would be food. It'd be helpless, powerless to be able to fly. In the same way, as parents, we provide structure for our kids to teach them boundaries. They beat themselves against us, and we feel that in, in terms of, of their their self-control, their anger, their tantrums, the I hate you's, you don't love me, I wish you weren't my parents, all these struggles that we experience in the home and and the structure that we create teaches them boundaries, how to respect others' boundaries, how to have boundaries themselves. It teaches them to respect the Lord, to trust him and to obey It gives them security in their own psychology and their own identity by the structure we provide around our kids. And as we see in part two today, children need structure and boundaries from their parents to learn limits, self-control, and especially the good news of Jesus. So let's read from God's word. Ephesians chapter six, verses one through four. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And all parents said, (laughs) Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, and mothers are implied here, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's go to the, word, uh, to the Lord here in prayer together. Father, we, we come to you, your word, we're here because we need you, Lord. The worship sets our hearts right, aligning us vertically 
with our need for you. Our need is to live for you, and our need is for you to be the center of our world, Lord God. And your word directs us and instructs us, Lord, what does this look like? How do we experience that? How do we live that out in our daily lives? We need you this morning. Open our hearts, Holy Spirit. Lord, as we talk about these things of parenting and even as children responding to our parents, Lord Jesus, we can't do this on our own. We come recognizing we need your spirit. We need you to invade us, to equip us. We're powerless and we fail and we fall short. We need your forgiveness. We need your love. So Lord, meet us in this space. And I just want to pray especially, Lord, my heart's been burdened today for parents who feel like they're failures and for parents or for, for, for all of us here who may have wounds from our parents. Those who are intended to protect, to provide for us, to, to love us, Lord God. And there may be wounds that are remaining that you want to speak to. And I just pray for your healing presence and power today to meet us in this, these spaces, Lord God, that you forgive you also heal and restore. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as God's word starts off here in, in Ephesians chapter 6, it's addressing children in response to a relationship with our parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Obedience to parents is good. Godly, and it gives protection for our kiddos. There's a promise here that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Many of us may have said or have heard that statement, I brought you into this world, and I can, I can take you out. How about that for an empty threat, right? <laughs> We're good at it. We can be good at empty threats as parents, right? Well, God has created this beautiful thing of, of family systems in order to form us and shape us. There's God as a perfect and a good design, but, but it's been broken by sin and, 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 and we don't experience the full blessings, but there's a good intention in this. In the family home where our kiddos, where kiddos, God gave you mommy and daddy in order to create a safe and healthy space to give you structure, to give you rules and boundaries where, you're, where, where, where you learn to obey them. And when you come under your mommy and daddy, when you obey your mommy and daddy, there's protection. There's protection. I need a couple of volunteers to help me with, with, uh, with something. Come on down. Is there a couple more volunteers who want to come on? Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. All right. Yeah, Maddie, you can come up. Yeah, come on up, Oakley. All right. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Oh, wow. This is great. Okay. Fantastic. You guys know what this is? It's a tarp. That's, that's right. That's right. Do, do you know what this is? Water. That's right. What do you suppose is going to happen? I'm going to dump it on there. Oh, I don't know. It may not be on there. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to dump it on, on you. All right. What does an umbrella do? An umbrella protects you. you from getting wet. It saves us from getting wet. Yeah, not really, yeah. Not really. Yeah. Actually, actually, it doesn't because I got wet from. from you can, yeah, it depends if things come sideways, right? Oh, we got more coming. Here we go. All right. So, so you know what? A, a, an umbrella is helpful. What? What? How does the umbrella work? When is it helpful? Actually, the umbrella. Has yeah. Go. Hold on a second. Go ahead. When it rains, it's helpful when it rains. And and when is it helpful in the rain? What do you have to do? Yeah, yeah. So you got to get under it, right? You got to get under it. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Bo, you want to come in and, and you want to hold it? All right, guys. Go ahead and get on the tarp there. And the water represents. The water represents the things of the. Are you guys good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so you know what? There are there. Are, the water represents when we want to do things our way in this world that there are consequences that we experience in life. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. 
You see, when we follow and obey mom and dad, we come under their protection and we experience them, oh my goodness, saving us from, from the, 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 the suffering and bad things in this life. How are we doing? Okay, we're not doing okay. No, you're doing great. You're wet. You're loving it. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so, now why did God give you guys mommies and daddies? To protect you. That's right. And so, hold on a second, Maddie. Hold on a second. So with, oh, oh Bo, you're, holy cow, watch out. You, you guys might get wet. All right. So is it easy to obey mom and dad? Sometimes. No, sometimes it is, right? No, it's not. It's not. But you know what? Even though it's hard to obey mom and dad, is it good? It is? Are you sure? Yeah? <laughs> well, some kids got a shower today. Well, thank you guys for helping me out. You guys can go take a seat. All right. We didn't know we were going to have a baptism service, uh, but we're... We're Baptists. A little dab won't do you here, right? You go under till you bubble. <laughs> Think about it. So God has given parents here to kiddos to protect. Obedience is hard, as Kaylee mentioned, but it's good. It's good. And it fosters in us kiddos it fosters in us learning that we can trust our Father in heaven, that he's good. You see, we learn, don't we, about who God is from our parents. Parents, we're teaching our kiddos. We create what's called a God image for them by, how the, by the love and the structure we provide for them. And we're forming their relationship with God the Father and their ability to trust in his goodness and his provision, and especially when we teach them to trust and obey. Now, the passage goes on here, as we saw last week. Parents, don't provoke your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline, last week we talked about, it, 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 it involves teaching, training, and correction. We've, when it comes to parenting with discipline, we've developed through life and circumstances, our own experiences growing up, a lot of different myths that we believe about parenting, that we need to break down with God's truth in order to experience God's blessing and bringing discipline into our homes and applying discipline to our kiddos. Last week we looked at discipline does not begin, it does not uh, just happen after disobedience. It doesn't happen just in the cases of disobedience. Discipline begins far before that and we unpacked a proactive, God's design for proactive parenting. This week here, jumping into one of the, the, the myths here, right away here, that discipline is something to avoid. Discipline is something to avoid. We, we may not say this out loud, but our actions oftentimes indicate that we believe this about discipline, that discipline is something to avoid, that, that maybe I can get away from, w w without having to employ consequences and use consequences in the life of my child. But the truth is discipline, consequences are necessary and good in order for us to learn and grow. Proverbs 29, 19 says this, the rod of, and reproof, or correction, give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. It's interesting that it focuses on mother there especially. The rod and reproof bring 
wisdom. You know, our attitude towards discipline gets reflected in how we approach it, right? One, that's two. You better stop that. You bet that's two and a half. All right, if you don't stop that, I'm going to come and you don't want to know what's good. That's 2.75. All right, listen, I'm serious now. Now I'm, don't make me come over there. I'm sure none of you have done anything like that. Maybe not counting in decimals. That's a math guy's kind of thing, right? You know, we'll delay it as much as we can, right? We'll make empty threats like you're, 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 you're going to lose video game privileges forever and, and just wait till you get home and there's no candy ever again. And we use threats that we can't follow up with. And these kinds of things, because of our attitude about discipline is negative, instead of like, this is good, I don't like it, Lord, I don't like it but I know this is good for my kids. It's good for me. I need your help in this, Lord. This is an opportunity to teach my children. My children need to be taught. It's an instinctive, inherent need. That's why God gave our children parents. They need teaching with love. Just like God sent his son to in, 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 who's full of grace and truth. We need, uh, from God the Father, even as adults, we need Structure, direction, affection, love. Our tactics reflect our attitude. Our children need us to employ and utilize consequences in their lives. It's uncomfortable. Just because it's difficult and painful doesn't mean it's not good. Maybe you found yourself saying, my kids, they just don't listen to me. You ever found yourself thinking or saying that? One of the aspects of this, when we, are, when we don't see the goodness and the importance of discipline, we delay it, what, ask, what happens is we begin to escalate the situation with our kids. We, we, we'll, 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 move, we'll try to focus on reasoning. If I, can just, if I just have enough time, I, 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 can, I can lay out a really good argument and they're going to follow my instructions. Just give me enough time here, right? All of us have found as parents that not enough talking will get our kids to learn the lesson, to comply to follow instructions, that there needs to be a consequence. Some of you, you need to stop talking and you need to put a consequence in place with your kids. You need to let your consequences speak for you. Let's talk a little bit here about consequences. If kids get what they want, they'll just continue the behavior that they're doing, right? This is just a, a basic fact of behavioral psychology. If their behavior gets them what they want, then they're going to keep doing it. If there's nothing that changes, then nothing changes in their behavior, right? Kids are pretty, you know, when we're growing up, we're pretty utilitarian. Teaching alone isn't sufficient. Children don't merely lack understanding. They lack self-control. So our consequences help reinforce and speak to the heart in words that ways, in ways that words cannot. Consequences speak to a child's heart in a way that words do not. Let's talk about just, this is very practical here, okay? This is kind of like a little bit of a parenting workshop of sorts, all right? So consequences, some of us may, may, may not be aware, like, what, what, what do I go? What do I do? What kind of consequences do I utilize? Last week, we talked about the importance of preparing in advance as parents, talking outside of the moment of, of, of disobedience because we're likely to react in that moment and it not be helpful and it not be a teaching thing. So in terms of determining consequences, it's helpful to, to have an idea of what are the things that are available and helpful to teach to my child. First off, in general, 
Consequences may be the removal of privileges. Consequences should never involve food, water, shelter, or love, your affection. I.e. meaning shaming, rejecting, withdrawing, putting your child down. Consequences should never involve food, water, shelter, clothing, or love. It's important for us to be clear about that. Everything else is on the table. Your kid doesn't need a Dr. Pepper. Your kid doesn't need that sweet treat. They don't need that. That's a privilege. Your kid doesn't need screen time. Consequences, everything else is on the table, if you will, and is really essentially a privilege on top of that. When we consider consequences of what might be helpful and effective, we consider things, first off, in terms of what's natural and logical to a situation. Do we already have a system set up where we're teaching our kids, have you done your responsibilities? Have you done your chores, cleaned your room, done your homework? Then you do not get screen time. You don't get that sweet snack. You don't get such and such because you have not done your responsibilities. We want to teach with our kids and inform them these natural and logical things that happen in life. Do you get a paycheck if you don't go up to work, show up to work? Nope, no paycheck if you don't work. We want to teach them responsibilities earns them privileges. That's just first a natural and logical system. Then if there's situations of disobedience, we want to look at another way of, of letting the, the, the punishment fit the crime, right? The punishment fit the crime. In a scenario where my, uh, my younger brother and older sister, they were after each other. They were just going after each other one of these days. And, and we were set to go to a, to a movie as a family. And my parents had had enough. They were with my brother and my sister. And what they did was they took, my dad took some rope and tied them together. <laughs> and they had to, as, un, until they figured it out and worked it out, some of you have seen these get along t-shirts that uh, parents put their, si little, their children, the siblings in together, and they're stuck together until they get along, right? My my, my dad didn't have a get-along t-shirt, but he had rope. Very practical. <laughs> tied them together. And they were going to have to stay tied together even at the movie. My dad had no shame. They, uh, they kind of quickly figured it out and, and uh, worked things out between the two of them. Well, the punishment fit the crime, if you will. If... if the, the disobedience is happening with a certain group of peers, then maybe we need to take a break from those peers, right? If the disobedience uh, is involving certain toys or the misuse of a cell phone or screen time, then we remove those privileges until we've earned trust to use those things again. A variety of different options that we've got, chores. We can add, add additional chores, timeouts, repaying someone if we've stolen or if we've broken things. If they don't have money, then they get chores to work for, right? We wanting our kiddos to learn how to reconcile if that's between siblings or between a friend, we want them to apologize and confess. There's a looming kind of question that comes up when we're talking about discipline and what's the role of spanking. And I want to invite you to come. Let's have a personal conversation about that because that one's a whole lot more complicated than this day and time. And it's not that it can't be utilized, but there are a lot of conditions where we need to talk through in order for that to be helpful and effective and it not go in a bad way. Let's talk about that. There was a day and time where that was normative. And, then, and when we moved from the Alabama to, uh, to Nebraska, 
And I started school, my dad approached the principal and he said, I just want you to know you've got full permission to spank my son if he's disobedient. You can imagine how caught off guard the principal was, even in Nebraska of all places. Essentially, the conversation was like something like this. We don't do that round here. If that is something that you're wondering about, let's come and talk. Next, next myth I want to hit on is that discipline requires that I get angry. This is really a, a struggle for many of us in, in parents. Like, how do we not, how do we not involve anger and discipline? And, 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 and this is such a struggle. And the, the issue that we're talking about is that, that too often we wait till we're angry to discipline our children, to correct them. As we've talked about, discipline begins way before that. We want to catch that in ourselves. How, how do, are we able to teach to our kids and it not come from a place of, of anger on our part? We just want them to shut up. We just want it to stop. How do we not get to that point? Oh, we've heard it or we've said it ourselves. Oh, they better not be doing whatever. And we're just getting all hot. This oftentimes happens too when we're, we're, when we're trying to reason with our kids and we're, we get locked into arguing. Any of you are, are good arguers with your kids or have good ki kids that know how to argue with you? We're all good at arguing, right? At some level. The more we're talking, the longer that means we're not disciplining. And the more we're talking, the more our temperatures likely rising. And that's when the unrealistic consequences come out. That's when un empty threats come out. That's when we say things to our kids that we can't take back. That's when the shaming comes. And kids don't associate then discipline with, they don't associate correction with love and teaching Kids will learn quickly that I can disobey as long as I don't. I know that voice that from mom. I know when it reaches that decibel. Bad things are coming. I know when, when dad gets to this point, that's when he really means it. We would like for our word to mean what we say without escalating to the point of anger. Proverbs 15 says this, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We can be just as much a part of the problem with our kids and that interaction as they are. Discipline isn't just about teaching our kids self-control. It's also for us as parents to learn self-control. So it's important to have a plan. Again, as I've mentioned before, these are, in order for our emotions not to take over, we need to be prepared outside of the moment. So here's a sequence of a, a kind of a script, if you will, to help, help give us something to follow and be prepared in these moments to help us remove some of the emotion from it. So we have a teaching moment. Instead of a fight, give the instruction, all right? Sometimes we've already given the instruction, but if it's a new scenario, we're giving the instructions, sweetheart, I want you to go clean your room. It's time to go clean your room. We give some time, we give a moment there, and, and, and uh, the chi said child uh, continues playing and doesn't follow the instruction. They're playing still. So then we warn or remind them, we do so with a consequence. Sweetheart, remember I just gave you the instruction. I need you to go clean your room. I want you to go clean your room. This doesn't happen if we don't follow instructions here, then we're going to have a timeout. 
we're going to lose our, our, we're going to lose some screen pr- privileges. We give a warning with, a, with, with the consequence. We also want to use this time to connect before we correct. And just check in, sweetheart, son, daughter. I notice that we're struggling to, to obey right now. Is there something happening in your heart? Do you, do, you, do you know why you're not obeying mommy right now? Do you know what's happening? Or I can tell that you're kind of angry at this moment. And just reflecting back to them, connecting, because if you see, sometimes we have more, you have more uh, strong-willed children, and they need this time of connection before correction because you've experienced it. You've got your own PTSD of like, okay, man, if I'm going to follow through, I better get ready for World War III here because it's going down now. Strong-willed children, those who are quick to escalate, they need a connection time to help release some of that fuse, release some of that pressure, and to know, hey, this, we're on the same team here. I'm not the threat. Here's the deal. Your children will still need correction. All of these things that we do are not going to be able to prevent and magically keep you from having to employ consequences. We need them. And so we got to be careful not to look at these things that we walk through that I talk about, that these magic bullets, that if we do this, then kids are going to be magically respectful and loving and obey. Did you say obey? Me, me, me. I want to obey all the time. Yes, me. No. Sorry, guys. It's just not going to happen. Do you obey all the time? Hmm? No. Somebody speaks the truth out there. So we give the instruction, I want you to do this. We warn with a consequence. If if you don't obey, then this is going to happen. Connect to correct before we correct if the situation requires it. And then the next step is that child is continuing to play with their toys. They haven't gone and cleaned their room. I don't go in there and say, why are you doing this? What's your problem? I just told you what to do. I, we don't go in there with that kind of stuff. Remember, we're, that, that's us escalating. No, we've already warned them. The next step is just a consequence. Okay, sweetheart, we talked about this. And what did we say? What was going to happen? We we're going to lose screen time. Yep. So have you been obeying? No. Okay, we lost screen time. Or it's, it's time to go on timeout. We bring the consequence. We stay under control, and we're praying throughout this time, right? Because some of us didn't learn how to be patient with kids or be patient with others. Some of us are imprinted with our own parenting experience, and we, we're emotionally engaged, right? We're feeling out of control ourselves. We're praying through this time. But these things do not require for us to be emotionally engaged. We're teaching to our kids. They need us to teach. That's the point. It's not to punish it's to teach. So we enforce the consequence and we walk away. We let the consequence speak for us rather than trying to engage and do more reasoning with our kid. We enforce the consequence. It's time to go into timeout. We walk away, we give ourselves space, but then we come back and we review with the kiddos. We review with our kiddos. All right, so what happened here? What was the instruction? What did mommy want you to do? What did daddy, what did I ask you to do? You know, we talked about, we've talked about how to use a cell phone. What happened here? Let's talk about what's going on here. Why did I, why did we take this step of removing the phone? Now, here's the deal. I love you. And we need to reinforce. When we come back, we need to reinforce, I love you, and my love for you doesn't depend on your behavior. Our love for our kids, just like our love from the Heavenly Father, never depends on our behavior. It was while we were still sinners, while we're still in rebellion against God and saying, forget you, it's my way. I mean, it's offensive our sin to God. And this is an offensive illustration. 
But our sinfulness to God is like giving God the middle finger. It's, it's outright rebellion. It's offensive. But it's while we are sinning, Jesus died for us. We do not remove love from our kiddos. And it's important for us to communicate that. I was, in, I was, I was intense. I was firm with you because I love you. If we get angry, then we apologize. I'm sorry, I love you, but I don't want to get angry. It's helpful to have a clear process. I'm going to give the instruction, I'm going to warn with the consequence, and then I follow through. Some of you are counters. Counting's not bad, as long as you actually are not afraid of getting to three, and you don't delay that. That's one. And sometimes this is very helpful. Some kids respond very, very well to counting. That's one. That's two. That's three. Okay. We're going to have a consequence. We're going to have a moment right now. We don't say that's three, and then we go keep talking and move on to something else. Counting can be very helpful, but we have to make sure that we're not giving ourselves time, and we're not delaying it. And again, we're not just going 2.1, 2.2. Y'all know what I'm saying. Let's move on to the next myth here. Discipline will drive my kids away. Discipline will drive my kids away. Proverbs 29, 17 says this, discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. Now some of you might be thinking like, my kids don't do that. They give me anxiety and stress. Over time, Scripture and the Proverbs aren't speaking of these magical promises, but there's these general guidelines and over time that are true, that has worked themselves out in our life as we trust the Lord and put them into practice. Discipline eventually will create children who regulate themselves and who want to obey. Discipline will not drive our kids away unless we do so with shame, without relationship and love involved. Discipline will drive our kids away. As its scriptures speak here, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. We provoke our children to anger. We push them away when we discipline without relationship. When we shame, when we lead by fear and intimidation, and we get compliance. We're not teaching to our kids. We're teaching them to avoid us in those moments. Discipline itself doesn't drive away, but discipline without relationship leads to rebellion. One of the cases in the families that I was working with back in Nebraska, we had a classic case where the father was... was uh, uh, very, very firm, too firm. And the mother sought to meet her emotional needs through her, through her son. And she was afraid that if she enforced things, that the son would push the son away. And she enabled him. And she gave in. And she unfortunately nurtured a powerlessness in relationship with her son, which didn't earn her respect from her son, he disrespected her more. He, did, he learned not to appreciate and value her, that she had no authority and he could walk all over her. The very thing that she wanted was the thing that she lost by seeking to avoid discipline, by seeking to keep the relationship with her son over disciplining him. The father, on the other hand, pushed his son away by being heavy handed. Children respect us more when they experience rules with relationship. 
We nurture respect in our kids when they experience discipline with love, correction with love, teaching with love. The final area that I want to touch on here is discipline is about changing behavior, getting my kids to do what I want. The truth is that discipline is ultimately about getting to the heart. Oftentimes, we find ourselves in parenting, if you do this, then, I'll, then you'll get this. If you'll just stop this, then you'll get this. When we're in survival mode, that's when we go to things. Like, you, you can have that piece of candy in the store if you just, just be quiet, shh, shh, stop it. Ultimately, what we're teaching our kids is to be manipulative. If we're merely teaching them behavior modification, and if you do this, you'll get this, we're teaching them, well, if I act up enough, then I'm going to get stuff. If I'm intimidating and I throw that tantrum, then I'm going to get what I want. Or we teach them, I only need to behave when mom and dad are around. When we merely teach behavior change, our goal is to get to our kids' hearts to have heart conversations. Proverbs 22, 15 says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. How is this true? This is true in how we are present with our kids in discipline. How we follow through and teach and correct with affection and with love. And we have these important conversations. We talked about those moments of connecting before we correct. So I just want to, I want to check in with your heart right now. It looks kind of like, it seems like you just kind of want to disobey right now. Is that kind of true? Sometimes you just name it with our kids. Is that, what's happening in your heart? These conversations, younger kiddos don't have that self-awareness, but we begin teaching them. I just want, can you tell me kind of what you're feeling right now? What's happening in your, inside you? Is that loving? Are you wanting to love mommy and daddy right now? Are you wanting to love your brother and sister by hitting them right now? Well, they need it. Do you need it sometimes? It's when we get into arguing. It's not good. It doesn't go good. We have heart conversations with our kiddos. After the fact, as we're disciplining them, as we follow up in these, in these uh, coming back conversations, we talk about, what happened here? We, we noticed that well, when you disobeyed, you, you took your brother's toys without asking, or you, or you stole this from the store. What was in your heart at that moment? Was that, were you thinking of the store? Or were, you, were you thinking of those other people you took from? Or you, your brother, or, or were you thinking of yourself? I was thinking, I was thinking of me. That was selfish, right? We had selfishness in our heart. What do we want to have in our hearts? This goes back to the goal of parenting. I want love for others, love for God. You know, I, it wasn't loving, was it? Well, let's pray to Jesus. Let's go to Jesus together. Let's pray, Lord Jesus, I need your love to come into my heart. Will you forgive me for stealing, for being selfish? And I want your love in my heart, Jesus. I want to respect others about property. And that comes from I need love in my heart. So these conversations, after the fact or when we're connecting with our kiddos, are really important to get to that heart level. And prayer is a powerful place. This is a powerful place where we teach our kids how to pray with the Father. Jesus, forgive me for taking this toy that wasn't mine or taking this thing that wasn't mine. And we walk through it with them. Jesus, forgive me. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. We ex our children are experiencing the gospel in these moments. And this is when it gets to the heart. Jesus, help me love you and to, and to love others. The goal for parenting isn't merely to change behavior. I want my kids to do what I say. We want to get to their hearts. 
This isn't something that happens immediately. Again, I do these things, and my children, they are transformed, and they're, 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 gonna, they're, they're loving Jesus and loving others. They're evangelists. They're, like, they're out there. They're telling, no. This happens over time. And in new seasons of our children's development, do new things come up, and we have to walk with them and teach with them. Discipline is good, godly, and necessary. Discipline not only only teach our kids limits and self-control, but it, it teaches them the gospel. We have communion today, and as we go into celebrating communion, this is a time for us, as we walk through the, the sermon series as parents and those of us who work with kids and in our jobs with our teachers or child care or maybe we're grandparents or uncles and aunts, but we realize how I've treated others. This apply, a lot of these things even apply in all of our relationships. And we realize we're convicted, Lord, I am prone to anger. I'm prone to reacting. I'm prone to seeking control rather than being under your control. I've messed things up. I've messed up. Communion, as we celebrate this, is this reminder, this experience that God gave us in a tangible way, this remembering that Jesus died in your place, that Jesus sought to to remove your shame and take your place in order to change you. Jesus on the cross doesn't want you to continue to parent out of shame and guilt, but out of his love. This is a fresh restart. It's a reminder that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us. We come to the table because we're weak and we're in need. We've messed up, but we're also powerless. Lord, I need you. I need your help to be patient. I need your help to follow through. I don't want to follow through. I'm afraid of losing my relationship with my my child. I'm I'm afraid that that they're going to hate me. Lord, help it not be about me. Forgive me for making parenting about me. And not about you loving you and loving my my children. Come to the table. I also want to speak to that many of us, we may have wounds from our parents. And Jesus' death on the cross, his body broken, his blood shed. In in 1 Peter, he, he explains this. It's by my wounds, by his wounds, you and I are healed. That there's pain, there's hurt, there's anger, there's unfinished business, there's things that keep coming to the surface and coming out of you even from your experience with your own parents. And the body and blood of Jesus is a reminder, he wants to heal you, he wants to speak to these areas. He wants to receive the pain and the poison and take it on himself on the cross and give you his healing. He wants to enable you to forgive. Forgive doesn't necessarily mean trust. It doesn't necessarily mean everything's made right. That's a whole different story. But you don't have to hold on to what's been done. Come to Jesus. Come to the table. Let him heal you. The past doesn't have to continue to have power over you right now in the present. Let Jesus change that for you. As we celebrate communion, this is open to anyone who's a follower of Jesus. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come to the table. Come and receive. If you've not received Jesus Christ, then just kind of reflect and sit by. More than that, actually, Surrender today. The table is open. The Father loves you. He wants you to know his power, his love, his forgiveness. Come and be part of the family. Today, surrender. 
I'm going to have the worship team come on down here. The worship team is going to pray, uh, uh, play instrumentally as we walk through and then play one of these, uh, a song for us all to sing. This is, as we take the communion up front, this is for you to take on your own. So you don't need to wait until we all receive it. But you and Jesus, you take this together. You just receive his work in your heart and your life. We have our elders or our couples come up front who are going to be serving communion. And, the, and just in terms of flow and instructions, if you'll come down these outer aisles and then exit up the middle aisle just to maintain, contain some flow, that'd be great. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, we come to you at this moment, Lord, and we thank you for your wisdom and direction in parenting. Lord Jesus, we pray for with our kiddos right now that, Lord, we acknowledge that sometimes it's very hard to obey. We want our own way. Lord, we need help to trust to trust our parents, that they have what's good in mind, to trust you, Father, in giving us parents or to obey. We just need your work in our heart and we need your forgiveness for how we don't want to obey. We want our own way. And Lord, as parents, we, we come and for care, as caregivers and Lord Jesus, we, we, we just acknowledge our, our struggle, Lord God, in the ways that we've messed up, the ways that we've fallen short, the ways that we have been selfish in our parenting. Lord, trying to do it our way and not your way. Trying to do it on our own without your power. Lord, we come now. We need you. Holy Spirit, we ask this moment that you would heal us, you would restore us. And those of us, God, who have wounds, Lord God, that continue to impact us now, Lord, wounds from our parents that continue to influence our lives and have power for us, Lord, wounds that, that, that continue to nurture and foster bitterness in us, Lord God, we come today, God, we want to be free. We need your body and blood, we need you to heal us, to take the poison from us, and we want to forgive we want to forgive our parents, Lord God, for what has been done, Lord Jesus. And we want you to replace that, God. We want you to fill that space, to take it for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you've died in our place. Thank you, Jesus, that you are enough. In your name we pray.